Hi, my name is Paul Ashworth. I'm here interviewing at the Public Library of Cincinnati and Mr. Clint Seitz on uh, Wednesday, July 26, at 2 p.m. and we're at the Westwood branch of the library. And uh, I'd like to introduce Mr. Seitz at this point. Uh, welcome. And uh, just to get a little background, um, you were from Delhi, originally Delhi, Ohio, which right. is a neighborhood of Cincinnati, Ohio. And where, where were you born? And what, what was your earlier? I, I was born right on the farm in Delhi. In a farm? Yes. It goes back. And the uh, you had started the in with the sites greenhouse operation. That's right. Yes. Okay. And now you live in Twin Towers over in Hamilton Avenue. You're still here in Cincinnati. That's right. And uh, you're retired, obviously. Obviously. Okay. Are you widowed or your wife with you? Or? I'm widowed. Yeah, I've been widowed for eight years. Oh. And how many children did you have? I have five children with nine grandchildren. Fine. Fine. And uh, is there anything else you want to tell us bibliographically before we start in with your... Well, not really. Uh, I guess we can go right into the fact that uh, I was uh, drafted into the Army in uh, April of 1942. And uh, I... Uh, uh, was uh, sent to Keister Field for my basic training and uh, then to uh, Chanute Field, Illinois, to a, a weather observer school. And um, I, I liked weather very much and after I graduated, why I uh, uh, required more action and I traded uh, a job for a certain uh, security for one of great danger from going into uh, the uh, the, uh, uh, the OCS uh, system and I went to uh, uh, Fort Sill Artillery School. I had never been an artilleryman but I became one pretty fast and after three months I was commissioned as a second lieutenant and uh, uh, assigned to the 12th Armored Division which was training at uh, Camp Camel, Kentucky which is right on the border of, of, of Kentucky and Tennessee and is now the, uh, the home base of the famous 101st Airborne Division and it's now Fort Camel, Kentucky. Well, um, after we uh, finished our training at uh, Camp Campbell, well, we went on Tennessee maneuvers. And uh, that was um, uh, mostly cross country and uh, crossing, uh, uh, practice crossing rivers and uh, this type of thing, and um, we, uh, uh, we, we really uh, had a lot of experience on, on uh, uh, cohesion of, um, of uh, units, and, and this was all part of the 12th Armored Division. Uh, there's an uh, amusing incident while we're on Tennessee maneuvers in that uh, one of the men in my firing battery, I was in B battery, the 495th Field Artillery Battalion, and the uh, battery is about 110 men, and uh, they they decided that they want to supplement some of the the uh, the army rations, and they had a nice looking fat cow uh, that they had their eye on. So they organized a, a killing and butchering operation, and they uh, they they killed this cow at night. Of course, this was unbeknownst to the the officers in the in the battery. And they, they killed this cow, and, uh, uh, and we didn't know anything about it until the next morning when the farmer showed up who owned the cow, and he had found the remains buried in a shallow grave, and he came to the officers and he wanted to know what the story was. And uh, so that we found the culprits who had killed the cow, and uh, 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 they, we decided rather than uh, take this to higher headquarters and possibly have it court-martial involved to have uh, battery uh, 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 deal, so they, so uh, punishment, so they, so we decided to assess each man the battery two dollars, and none of them were very happy about this, except that they decided that, well, since they paid us two dollars, they should get something in return for their, uh, for their investment. So the uh, uh, mess sergeant decided to, uh, he would uh, try to prepare this uh, this meat from this cow, and 
it was uh, so filled with uh, wild onions that uh, the odor and the taste was so bad that he couldn't even eat it. So that was a story about the cow. Well, after we finished Tennessee maneuvers, uh, we were we the whole division moved to uh, Camp Barclay at Abilene, Texas, where we finished our training before going overseas. And this we were uh, an armored uh, field artillery a battery, a part of a of a of a battalion uh, in the 12th Armored Division, and, a, and an armored division had about 11,000 men. Uh, we uh, we finished our, tra our training down in uh, in Camp Barkley, where uh, I met my wife, and um, I had a had a uh, an officer's uh, party one night as a blind date, and we were, we just knew each other uh, five or six weeks until we were married. And uh, uh, about uh, a month after that, well, we went overseas. So um, uh, my wife uh, stayed with my folks here in Cincinnati for the time I was overseas, about a year and a half, and I, I joined her in Massachusetts later. That's the state where she was from. And so we, we continued on through the years, and we were finally married 54 years. Well, back to my story. Um, uh, we, let's see, we were at uh, uh, Camp Barkley, Texas. And um, we went uh, by, uh, by um, troop train to Camp Shanks to uh, board ships for, uh, for Europe. And uh, uh, we were part of a convoy, a very large convoy of, uh, of ships, of some transports and a lot of troops carrying uh, ships in addition to the 12th Armored Division. There were about 35 ships in all. And uh, on this uh, 10 or 11 day trip over to England, why, uh, we, had, we were hounded by uh, German submarines. And uh, uh, we were, uh, we were guarded by some uh, some Navy destroyer escorts, and they were they'd go scooting around through the convoy, and at night they would stay out at the perimeter of the convoy and drop depth charges, and we'd hear these booms during the night to try to have the uh, the German submarines keep their distance from the convoy. So um, we we finally landed in, in Bristol, England, and we went to a to a temporary camp. And uh, this was called Camp W, and uh, we had, we knew nothing about it, and we didn't know how long we we're going to be there. But but actually, it was a um, an air base where the uh, the uh, the airborne troops had taken off for the Market Garden operation uh, in 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 Holland during the month of um, of September of 1944, and this operation had failed. Well, anyway. We, we got to this camp and we found that it had been abandoned, but it had been locked up so no troops or anybody else could get in it. And the, the, uh, the, the latrines were, were, were overflowing. They had like big, uh, looked like seven gallon coal buckets that were not need, need to be empty. So um, we had to dispose of this stuff quickly because the, this, the whole camp was in this situation. Well, being a low rank second lieutenant, I got the, the, uh, uh, the detail of uh, getting rid of this mess. So we somehow procured some, uh, some shovels and, and picks and, uh, and, and began to, to dig a hole. And we, I got my, uh, my uh, detail by the old army method of uh, volunteers, you, you, and you. <laughs> so, so we... Uh, we proceeded to, to dig a hole, and uh, we had this 10 by 10 by 3 foot hole almost completed when uh, the, uh, the farmer came in with his oxen and his honey cart. And he came up to the place where we're digging and he said, who is in command here? And, uh, and, um, and uh, sort of, and, uh, I, was, I was very, very um, uh, ashamed of what I was telling him. I said, I am, sir, and he said, he, he said, do you know that you can't dig a hole in the king's soil? And I said, well, <laughs> you, you stand around a little while and you'll see, the, you'll see us dig this hole. Well, uh, before he left, uh, we had the mission accomplished. So that was a story on, 
on, on that. But we were eventually um, uh, 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 barracks in, uh, in Tidworth Barracks, which was a well-known uh, camp that many troops had gone over to Europe and had been in before. And uh, while we were there, why, um, uh, I was assigned to a, an advanced detail to go to France ahead of the division to, to uh, process some vehicles. And we went over across the, uh, the uh, channel with a very small ship and uh, we, we landed at Cherbourg, which is way up at the head of the, the, uh, the peninsula. And um, uh, we, uh, we, we found these vehicles and we, we proceeded to process them. And um, uh, while we were there, my, my good buddy John Carnash and I uh, got around to see the country when we weren't busy. And uh, we borrowed the, the motor officer's uh, Jeep and uh, went to three um, uh, cemeteries in an attempt to find his three first cousins who were killed in the invasion and the outbreak in the 828th Division. And we needed to go to all three of these, uh, these cemeteries before we found his three, the graves of his three cousins. And uh, at this stage, why we were really shocked to see the many, many, many rows of white crosses of people had been killed in the invasion and the breakout, and it was quite a shock to us. But um, uh, we, we finally finished this, uh, this uh, uh, detail and linked up with the rest of the division, which uh, a few days later came into uh, the board of La Havre. Did you find the, the uh, graves? Yes, we found, found these three first uh -huh. graves. And the ironic thing about this was that my good buddy was, was killed himself in, as, a, and as an air observer for our battalion. He was a, uh, a spotter in a, in a small um, L-4 plane, uh, Piper Cup. And he was shot down and killed, and so that was another one in, it, in his family that was killed. So that was quite a blow to us. Well, we we uh, we traveled from um, La Havre area to uh, to Metz, France, and then south to um, uh, out to Alsace Lorraine, and joined um, General Pat's, Patch's Seventh Seventh uh, uh, Army. And the 12th Armored was a part of the 7th Army uh, until the end of the war, except for a short period of time when we were with General Patton. Uh, while we were in, um, in, uh, in Alsace Lorraine, uh, the, the Germans attempted to uh, uh, take back the, the city of Strasbourg. And uh, they called this operation Nordwind which I guess in English was North Wind, but anyway, they came across the Rhine with uh, uh, wooden barges that carried heavy tanks and, and all their artillery and their, uh, their personnel and equipment. And um, uh, it, we had a, a really tough battle out there. In, in one particular uh, case, we were, we were around the city of, uh, of Herlesheim, just north of Strasbourg. Uh, we had um, terrible, terrible losses uh, at, in that town with many uh, killed, captured, many captured, and many wounded. Uh, and um, we, uh, we eventually uh, uh, were pulled back out of the line and uh, uh, licked our wounds and we had a lot of replacements. And uh, we finished this operation in, uh, in, in uh, Alsace Lorraine until uh, the 9th Armored Division had uh, seized a bridge at Remagen, uh, a railroad bridge, and had gotten started crossing the Rhine. So we, we were uh, called to, uh, in the middle of the night one night to obliterate all our, the markings on our vehicles. And uh, I, we, were, we were then known as the Mystery Division. Well. During the night, we moved uh, about 50 miles north and joined uh, General Patton to, uh, to go through the uh, Siegfried Line, uh, 
near the city of uh, Tr Trier. And um, we had quite a battle there, and um, we um, eventually went south and crossed the, uh, the, the uh, Rhine River at, at Worms, Germany. Well, on this uh, deal where we were going south, uh, I was executive officer of the firing battery, which uh, had six uh, self-propelled howitzers mounted on medium tanks, and uh, uh, we uh, we had we had fired quite a lot of uh, fire missions. And this one particular day, I allowed the, the uh, vehicles to get to, uh, to uh, too close to the intervals, and the battalion commander came around and chewed me out for for this deal. So I immediately put the 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 uh, battery into firing position, even though we were only uh, about a thousand yards from the our objective, the town that we were supposed to capture. Well, I had the, this aiming circle, which I, I used to lay the six guns in, at a certain azimuth and in parallel. And while I was uh, uh, using this aiming aiming circle to uh, set the to to uh, lay the battery. We saw um, uh, bursts of, of uh, German artillery coming towards us, just like it was walking over to us. And we knew immediately that the, uh, there was some German uh, uh, field artillery ob observer, just like our own, probably in a church steeple, uh, directing fire on us. Well, before I could finish my detail, one uh, artillery round landed right in the middle of our position. And uh, there were six of us hit with uh, with uh, uh, shrapnel, with uh, 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 shell projectiles, and uh, three of them were hurt uh, quite badly and had to be evacuated. Well, I was pretty lucky; I just had some shrapnel in my right arm, but went, went right on uh, with my duties. But that's that's how I got my Purple Heart, which was a sort of a cheap way of getting it when you consider how bad some of these these people were hurt in in combat. But uh, anyway, um, we uh, we proceeded uh, south to uh, to to the uh, site where they had uh, uh, pontoon bridges set up, and we crossed the Rhine and and, uh, and went farther into Germany. Now um, we uh, uh, we were we spearheaded the, the Seventh Army down through Württemberg, uh, Baden. Uh, in, in and through Bavaria and uh, down to the Austrian uh, border. Um, this this uh, operation uh, down the, down through uh, Germany after we crossed the Rhine, we moved pretty fast. We we encountered only sporadic uh, 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 resistance, and um, uh, we. Uh, we went down to uh, all the way down to, through Austria, and on this trip, we found out later that uh, this route we took was what the Germans use uh, as one of their uh, their their trips over in, in Germany, as they call the, the Rom Romantic Road. That uh, several of these towns that we had uh, captured uh, were walled towns that. Uh, Foreign troops hadn't been in for for many years, so we we uh, we captured all those and we got down to uh, south of Munich. And uh, my particular battery uh, was only 100 so so men, and usually we we uh, we travel as a, as a battalion or as a combat command, which was a third of the the armored division. Well, uh, we were south of, of Munich. And uh, uh, we we uh, we had a, a very small uh, detachment of uh, beside my my artillery battery of 100 100 men that there was a, a part of a battalion of tanks and a part of a battalion of of, uh, of infantry that did it that circumvented the, the the Worm Sea and we did this all night and we got around this 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 uh, this lake and. Uh, we had sporadic uh, resistance, and we at daybreak, why well, we broke out onto the uh, German autobahn, the uh, superhighway. Well, uh, we we uh, 
hit this highway and didn't find resistance immediately and and, and traveled on down to uh, through this uh, through Austria and uh, south going south and southeast and uh, this was a story that uh, finally came out as uh, made as uh, covering 59 miles in seven hours which was quite a feat because uh, we'd uh, we, we had uh, uh, sporadic uh, resistance along the way and uh, uh, fired my, my fire, firing battery of six guns in, in the Audubon using both sides of the, of the highway with, uh, with three guns on each side and we fired about three missions this way. Well, things were going well uh, until we came to uh, uh, something that really surprised us in, in that all the, uh, the small uh, clusters of trees along the highway had these much hate, hated uh, German jets, the Messerschmitt 262s, and they were back under the trees with all the, uh, the necessary uh, munitions, but no fuel. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, the way it finally ended up is uh, that many of these uh, Messerschmitts were, uh, were uh, intact, and some of them were taken back to, to the States, and they, they were used in, in research to, for our own uh, uh, jet planes, finally. Well, farther down the highway, uh, we went across a bridge over a deep, deep ravine, and as the uh, the last uh, vehicles in the uh, column went over this. We noticed that uh, they had, we had some of our uh, infantry had, they were lying on, uh, prone on the bridge and trying to pick it off the Germans who had, uh, were attempting to get to the detonators to blow this bridge. Well, we were lucky enough to get our, uh, our whole uh, uh, column across. And after we got the last vehicle across, the Germans blew the bridge. So the troops that followed us, our own division, and behind them the 101st uh, uh, Airborne Division, uh, had to find a, a detour that took them a couple days to get down to where we, where we finally ended up. Well, we, uh, we reached the, the Inn River, which was the boundary of Germany and Austria. And uh, from there we, uh, we, we got the, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the order to, uh, instead of proceeding, to do a, a 90 degree turn into the, into the Austrian Alps. Well, the Austrian Alps were no place for an armor division. And uh, so um, uh, we, were, we were pretty much all there. Well, we're, this was very close to the end of the war. We were just a few days until the end, and we were taking many, many, many prisoners. So we, um, we, we uh, hauled it there after uh, three of our four observers got up into the, into the, uh, into the mountains, and we had three, three of our four observers killed in the second last day of combat, which was sort of sad. Um, we, uh, we, we hauled it there until we, we got the order to uh, head on up the Audubon and, uh, and around the detour because the war had ended there and it was about the 6th of May that we finally, finally finished our, our operation. My battery fired the last rounds of the whole armored division and uh, uh, we, we, uh, we were pretty proud of this, but uh, uh, when, you, when, when I consider the attitude of the men after this uh, had ended, uh, they, they didn't seem jubilant, they, they just didn't know what to think. It, was, it happened so suddenly, and uh, at that point we didn't know what our, our future was going to hold in store. So that, that's, that's the story on that. So. Sounds very interesting. Um, what happened then at that point? Did you stay around for occupation or did you ship back? Well, we, we, uh, we stayed around for occupation and the men who, who uh, had uh, enough points were sent home and the rest of us were transferred to other organizations and, and we, uh, 
we did our, our army of, of occupation from then on. Uh, in my particular case, uh, I, I was um, transferred to the 36th Infantry Division, the famous uh, Texas Division, and soon after that, they were uh, they were sent home with uh, with nothing but their orders. It was very very fewer, or I guess none of their original people. And then I was transferred to a to an, uh, a, uh, a a field artillery observation battalion that had been a sister uh, battalion of the of the one that was uh, that was uh, mowed down and murdered at Malmody in the uh, in the Battle of the Bulge. You may have heard of uh, Mal Malmody. Well, this this was a sister division, a sister a battalion of of that battalion. And uh, while I was in this battalion, boy, uh, we had the job of uh, guarding six internment camps uh, around the city of, of Ludwigsburg. And this was quite an interesting feat. But uh, uh, among all, all the men I had in my battery, they were, they were all uh, 18 and 19 year, year olds with uh, very little uh, army training and no esprit de corps and it was almost impossible to get them together to uh, assemble them and give them give them much much uh, uh, de details of what they're really supposed to do but they did stand guard at these camps well uh, uh, at this uh, uh, one particular camp the, lar the largest camp the word came down one day that we were supposed to get uh, the uh, Nazi, the American Nazi leader Fritz Kuhn into this camp. So uh, the our uh, camp commander, he was only a second. I was a first lieutenant, but the camp commander was a second lieutenant. And he decided to to screen the, this guy's record to see what sort of a job he was going to do, give him in, in prison. So uh, he found out that he was a, a chemical engineer. And uh, Fritz Kuhn, who I guess was lying pretty low, or I don't know whether or not they had him uh, uh, locked up in the, in the States. But anyway, most of his uh, career was, was prior to World War II, and he was a pretty mean uh, a Nazi in, in the United States. So he came into camp with uh, two uh, two and a half ton six by sixes loaded with, uh, with loot from the States. <laughs> He had uh, clothing and he had food and cigarettes and everything else. And I don't think uh, when he kind of went overseas, he was aware that he was going to be uh, in incarcerated. Mm -hmm. But anyway, we got him into this camp. So uh, uh, this, uh, this camp commander had, had given him a, a detail. And I was over two or three days later checking uh, my people on guard. And I went up to the third third floor where they had an, uh, an, an open courtyard, and uh, there was a big vat up there. And uh, Fritz Kuhn was up there with a stick, fishing out uh, uniforms that were being dyed for the purpose of, <laughs> of these prisoners. So he was a chemical engineer that <laughs> given him a job. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, this uh, this pretty well uh, covers. Uh, uh, the, uh, the story in general, and I could go into detail with some of the other other stories. Just as a follow-up, were there any of the Malmody uh, German uh, prisoners there in the camps that you were in? Uh, no. Did they no, 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 no. Pfeiffer or Pfeiffer? No, no. 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 Did you uh, participate in any of the uh, tribunals afterwards then? No, no, I didn't, no. Okay. But we had some of the... Uh, the, the uh, prisoners in our camp that were eventually tried at uh, Nuremberg, mm -hmm. some, of the, some of the lesser ones, yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, you mentioned Patton before. Did you ever have the experience of seeing him? No, I did not. Some, some of the people in our division did see him. Uh, there were two armored divisions cro crossing roads got at right angles one day, and he was out there directing traffic. I thought that was just the movies. <laughs> he really was. Yes, he was out there directing oh, traffic. Great. Yeah. And you didn't see him at No, I didn't. No, I never saw him. Okay. No, no. And is it, uh, 
in his reputation as far as the you, you are you, were you concerned? I mean? Well, uh, they, they most of the men respected him, but uh, they didn't particularly like him because uh, so, so mostly from some of the stories they'd heard about him. Mm -hmm. But uh, he he didn't get along with some of these uh, superior officers too much, and uh, he was sort of sort of a, a renegade, and he really wanted to take on the Russians I mean, uh, mm -hmm. after the war, and which was a, a frightful thought, really. Well, he did the slapping incident, too. I guess that kind of damaged his Well, yeah, uh, that's, yeah that, that story didn't help the situation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Did you see any other famous leaders while you were in the I saw, I saw a, a, a French uh, a general in, in, in Strasbourg. I saw him with his, with his uh, insignia on his jeep come by one day. And then the French, that's another story. While we were in Alsace, especially uh, uh, north of uh, Strasbourg, we were uh, attached to the, to the French First Army. And uh, my battery commander, who was next in, uh, in line in the in command in the battery, he was, he was, he commanded the battery, I was second in command. He was a West Pointer and an intellectual, and he spoke fl fluent French. Well, uh, uh, the division artillery, which was quite a large outfit of about uh, 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 2,000 men, uh, they, they needed somebody to, to be a liaison with the French, so my battery commander was a perfect man for it, so <laughs> he left the battery, so I, I had the, the, uh, the responsibility of uh, firing this battery and moving it around while he was with the French. Well, apparently he had more uh, respect for the French than I did because uh, many, many of the people that worked with the French said, yeah, they had no use for them. They, they, uh, the French were, uh, were sullen. They, they had very, they had very uh, poor discipline generally, and uh, they, they were just not, not good fighters. In uh, one particular incident, uh, we were in, in a position down south of Hagenau, which was quite a bit south of, of Strasbourg as well. And uh, uh, we had gone into this position at night and everything was strictly blackout. And uh, we, we came into this position and we were supposed to be supporting the French and they had great big flashlights shining them around to, to direct our our vehicles and our guns in a position, and I thought, uh oh, we're, mm -hmm. we're in for it. We're in for it, good. So we went into this position, and the next day we did get some some counter battery fire because because the Germans had located us. We were down in the in the Rhine Plain, and uh, 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 the, 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 we could see a long long distance away, and we could see the the Rhine hills on the opposite side of the Rhine in quite a distance. Well, well. Anyway, uh, the uh, the French ha artillery had a, a battery of towed guns, which was four four towed one o howitzers had trails, and they had to dig the trails in. They were uh, situated right behind us, and they were shooting over our heads, which didn't bother us any, except that uh, <laughs> as as, uh, as the days went on, we were there for several days. And there was a, uh, a road that went right past our battery position from one town to the next. And um, uh, some of the, the uh, townspeople would, would just go up and down the road in spite of the fact that it, wasn't, it was sort of dangerous. And uh, uh, there were some, some girls came down the, the road and these, uh, these uh, uh, French uh, artillerymen would leave, leave their guns follow these girls right into town, one yeah. after another. Well, the, they, the French guys got a fire mission. So instead of having four guns to fire, there weren't enough men left in the battery so they could fire only two. The rest of them had gone into town with the girls. And this is just typical of the French. Priorities. Yes, yeah. Well, in, in the same, uh, same battery position, um, uh, one evening, one of the section chiefs came up to me, a sergeant, and he said, Sergeant Anderson, he said, he said, Lieutenant Seitz, he said, I hate to tell you this, and it's all getting almost dark, but one of my, one of my cannoneers is missing. I said, missing? How could he be missing? 
And he said, you just took off somewhere. So I said, well, what can we do? It's almost dark and we can't go out there in, the, in this swamp and try to find this guy. So uh, uh, one of my, my recon sergeant said, well, this, this pr private dresser was one of the f favorite guys in the battery. And uh, this, uh, my uh, recon sergeant said, well, we'll, we'll go out to hunt to, to see if we can find him somewhere. So he was getting his crew together when Private Dresser came into the battery and he was, he had turned green from fright. He was down in the swamp lost and the next thing he knew there was a, there was a, a big blade to his throat and it had been a, a, a Moroccan soldier a, a, with a French and he, he found Dresser in a dark and he, by the configuration of his, of his helmet, he figured he wasn't German, so he didn't get the knife. So he, this Moroccan brought this private dresser back to the battery, and he had been hunting deer. And uh, I'll, I'll guarantee you that private dresser didn't uh, didn't leave the battery position again during the rest of the combat. Yes. <laughs> you had mentioned that uh, I think it was Strasbourg, where you had uh, heavy losses. Yes. Yes. Do you remember roughly? Uh, the losses? No, 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 I, I can't, I can't. But, but we had one uh, infantry uh, company, C Company of the 66th Infantry, uh, had a high percentage of ASTP uh, men who were uh, from a special program in the state, states, Army, Army, uh, Army Special Training Troops who were supposed to be trained as specialists and a lot of them eventually as officers. Well, uh, during the Battle of the Bulge, there was such a need for uh, uh, infantry replacements that they stopped the, this ASTP course and sent some of these troops over as infantry replacements and the losses in other outfits were just terrible among these ASTP guys. Well, this, uh, this particular company, the C Company of the 66th Infantry, near this, this town of Hurleysheim, uh, uh, had uh, the, uh, the, the, or the uh, command of um, attempting to take this uh, uh, famous woods, Steinwall Woods. Well, this was so, so well known to all of us in the artillery and the artillery observers, especially the four observers, in that it was just bristling with uh, with German uh, uh, machine guns and anti-tank guns and whatever else, and this uh, uh, infantry company was was to jump off before dawn and attempt to take this uh, this Steinwall Woods. Well, and it, they didn't know the terrain, and from lack of good training, they they bunched up and. This whole company was machine gunned, and they had many, many uh, killed, and uh, many captured, and and uh, and many, many wounded. And uh, uh, the the, um, the Germans the next day came out to to see if any of them were still alive. And it was one of the local fellows, uh, Bob Howler, who was a businessman in Cincinnati. He, he was one of the lucky ones. He had been hit slightly. The Germans picked him up and took him back across the, the Rhine River. Uh, and he has spent the rest of the war as a prisoner of war. They took care of him of his wounds and he's, he recovered. Of course, these, these prisoners of war, they, they also had some terrific stories to tell about how they were starved and how they were, they were moved around. Well, this... Uh, Steinwall Woods that the, this infantry outfit had attempted to take had, was never captured. Uh, there were two uh, div uh, infantry divisions in, the, in this area ahead of us. They failed to capture it and uh, we failed to capture it and the Germans eventually pulled out and went back across the Rhine. And when uh, they finally uh, pulled out, well, the, the people who went in and uh, and uh, and did some reconnaissance the area found out that they, all their um, their installations were covered with logs. They were so well 
it's so well uh, taken care of and camouflaged that in spite of all the artillery that we threw into this, this, uh, this uh, woods, we weren't doing any good. And so uh, this, was, uh, this was just another experience we had. But this time, Wall of Woods in that area was, was quite famous in the fact that, that nobody could, could capture it. At Strasburg, uh, who did, did, was that a draw, or did we eventually the, 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 the French had, had probably captured it, and they, they, uh, they, they just held it, uh, and uh, uh, they, they made no attempt to, to, uh, to spread out and, and capture the other land around it, which was the Colmar pocket, which was south of this. And that's where the Germans had, uh, had still had a bridgehead across uh, the Rhine, and they were uh, supplying these troops in the Colmar pocket. Well, uh, uh, Eisenhower decided he's not going to let it up to the French. He's just going to take some American troops and go down there and clean out this Colmar pocket. Well, the 12th Armored was, uh, was part of this, uh, this, uh, this uh, uh, detachment that, that cleaned out the Colmar pocket. And we, we got records uh, and quite a lot of, uh, of uh, 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 well, some uh, French decorations and things like that for cleaning the pocket. Uh, so so uh, the Americans really did, did the job on that. And this was just prior to the fact, to the finally, uh, uh, final, uh, 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 duties that we had in, in uh, Alsace-Lorraine before we went north and, and crossed the Rhine. Did you cross the Rhine at, uh, on the bridge from Uh No, no, we were south of that. Okay. Yeah, we, we, that was up in the, in the, in the first, first Army uh, uh, section. We were in the 7th Army and we crossed at, uh, at the city of Worms on, the, on pontoon. Two, two pontoon bridges. Yeah. Yeah. During the Battle of the Balls you did? No, this was, uh, yeah, this was uh, this was quite a lot long after. Quite no, I mean, long. Were you in the battle? No, no, no. We were south of that. We were down in in this Nordwind operation mm -hmm. where the Germans attempted to 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 uh, to capture Strasbourg, mm -hmm. and this was uh, really it started in in late January, in the middle of in late January, and this was about the time that uh, they called the uh, uh, the. Uh, uh, battle, uh, the Battle of the Bulge was finishing up. But you didn't get switched up there? No, like, no, uh, we didn't, no. We're, did we're, you say, you mentioned you, uh, the, that you took many German prisoners? Yes. Did you uh, have any chance to hear some of the reactions? Uh, were they dispirited, or demoralized, uh, Well, say, what the heck? Well, uh, we, we, we had it both ways, really, depending on the situation and, and the type of tr troops. We had taken some very young ones and some very old ones, and, and a few SS troops, and it, it depended on their status okay. in the German army, really. Okay. And you never saw them, they just shipped them back right away? Yeah, we, we sent them back to the troops behind us. Okay. Yeah, we, did, we didn't process many, many prisoners because it, an armored division was really on the move. Right, right. That was the story of it, yeah. And your uh, Purple Heart, were you... Uh, Recovery and, and recovery very long. For you? No, no, I, I was just out a couple of hours, and I was oh. right back. Yeah, oh, okay. and they did try to dig this couple of little pieces of trap out of my arm, and I was right back in it. Dude. They dig it out. Yeah. Do they just yeah. keep it? No. <laughs> no. Yeah. Okay. No. Just out of curiosity, how was the meals in there? Well, uh, ge generally good. Uh, there were times when uh, these tr these troops would be up as a fo on a forward observer. Detail, and they had to live on K rations or C rations. Uh, but besides that, boy, uh, boy, it wasn't very good, very bad at all. In our particular case, in our firing battery, we happened to have a a, a, a German fellow. I guess he was born in Germany, and he was an excellent cook. Oh. And uh, this this was a good detail for us. You know? mm -hmm. yeah. And were you ever in the forward? Observer oh yes. Position. Yes, I started out as a foreign observer uh, uh, just before Christmas. Um, I was sent up with the with the uh, uh, um, the mechanized cavalry near near the uh, town of uh, of Uckweiler. and I was up for, for four days 
until uh, Christmas Eve, I was called back back to the battery because they said the, the uh, division was going to move and the, the 100th Division was going to take the place of the 12th Armored in the line. Well, I got back to the battery with my crew. I had a, a half track and a, and a jeep and uh, uh, a, radio, a radio and a, uh, we were in contact with a recon and I had fired several uh, fire missions on, on, on the German uh, personnel around that while. And I got back to the battery position and they, they called for another foreign observer to go up with the infantry to locate uh, a, um, a machine gun that had been really bothering a lot of people and caused a lot of casualties. And um, our executive officer, who was a uh, first lieutenant, he was then second in command to the to Captain Carey, the West Pointer, he volunteered to go up as a, as a Ford observer, and I don't know how, why the, uh, the battalion higher-ups allowed him to do it, but he went up as a Ford observer, and he was up only a couple of hours, and he was mortally wounded, and he died on Christmas Day. So uh, this was a, really a blow to, all, to men in a battery because this first lieutenant, Malmrose, had taught th th those guys everything they knew as cannoneers and everything in a battery. And to lose a man like that was quite a blow. Mm -hmm. Well, I immediately got his job. And I know that these guys didn't think much of me. I was a second lieutenant and, and uh, not very much uh, uh, experience. But I had been trained to, to, uh, to be a, a battery executive officer to run the f firing battery. I had been back to Fort Sill to uh, go to survey school and uh, had, I had a pretty good knowledge of fire direction, this type of thing. So I took over as, a, as battery exec and I thought it was a temporary thing, but as it worked out, why I was uh, the battery exec, exec and ran the firing battery for the remaining five months of the war till the end of the war. So that was the story on that. Um, something that hit me on the thin and gray red line. Um, there's a line in there about how the uh, effects of artillery was more superficial than it was actual accurate and or demoralizing. Uh, did you find that in your situation? Well, well, this this was so, somewhat true, but when when you speak to our own troops, the people that we supported, the infantry and the and then tankers. They were mighty thankful for having us because we, we, we generally did a really good job. Now, the, the 105 howitzer had, had a, a habit of, uh, of uh, having, having a, quite a lot of dispersion. I mean, you, you couldn't actually drop two, two successive rounds in the same hole. Mm -hmm. it, as a, the 155 howitzers, the 155 long tom guns could do, we, they weren't that accurate. But ours was more of a of a uh, of an area firing firing deal, and, and you, since you brought up the the, uh, the subject of artillery, I might mention uh, one of the things that uh, that we did that was that was really <laughs> scary when you think of it. Something they called TOT was time on target. Now the uh, the uh, the core or or Army would select a, a, a target like uh, an edge of a, of a large woods or a, a road intersection and they, they would give the coordinates and a time to, to fire to the, the, or the time on target not the time to fire we had to, we had to calculate that but uh, but but they have many many battalions and many uh, Corps artillery and army, uh, armor, army artillery and everybody firing on the same target. Now, all the rounds were supposed to arrive there at the same time. Oh. And you can imagine how devastating this would be. Yes, yes. And uh, uh, when we had one of those, we'd hear the 8 inch and the 240 millimeters go off ahead of ours and then we had a time to fire and, and we all fired to, uh, to, for, so those rounds would arrive almost the same time on, a, on an area. And, and that was quite devastating. Yes, yes, quite, quite a devastating thing. Yes. That was a time on target. And then there's another story I have about uh, 
uh, firing uh, propaganda leaflets. Occasionally, we get um, some some propaganda leaflets to fire, and uh, and this one particular uh, time, we we had we uh, over the battalion radio, I, we were told that we were going to receive 50 rounds of 105 ammunition with. Um, uh, propaganda leaflets, and we were good, we were sent the uh, coordinates of nine targets, uh, to ten, ten targets to fire these 50 rounds. Well, with only 50 rounds of artillery, we we decided we were going to pull a whole battery out. We were going to do it with just one gun. So we took the number one gun, and uh, uh, we decided he was going to do the job. And t during the rest of the night, from uh, midnight until five in the morning we computed the necessary commands to fire this uh, this uh, propaganda ammunition well propaganda shells were like the the normal uh, what we call time time shells where where the time of a flight would would be set on the on, on the on the fuse well uh, the the, uh, the the times were were set on these fuses so the, we we wanted the burst uh, to to uh, to be about 20 to 30 yards above the above the uh, the target, so it would spread this this propaganda. Well, in this particular case, we never did see the the, the leaflets ourselves, but I took this one uh, howitzer at five o'clock in the morning, and it, if we were supposed to fire it at six, and we, of course this was in winter time, it was dark, so. Um, we we uh, we had decided that we 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 would pull away from the battery and had a, had to find a uh, position farther uh, up toward the front lines to reach these coordinates because some of these road uh, intersections and towns that were the targets were out of our range. So so we just took the the, uh, the photo map and we we guessed where the front lines would be and we selected a spot and stuck a pin, and from that pin we calculated the, uh, the uh, necessary commands and the round that to get these, these 50 rounds out to these, these coordinates. Well, when, I, when we figured we found the spot, which was the pin on the map, and put, we were running, putting this gun in position, and I had my aiming circle out, out with a little light on it, and we was laying this gun, Suddenly, all around us, forms came up from the ground, and we found that we were right in the center of a of a uh, friendly mortar position. They were all dug down in the ground, and we happened to be right in the middle of our area. Well, these guys were incensed. They were really mad because uh, they figured that if we hit, we fired from their position, we would probably draw enemy counter battery fire. Well, we had all our commands and all our uh, coordinates and everything to fire, so so we, at 6 o'clock, we fired our 50 rounds and got out of there. <laughs> and to my knowledge, I don't think that they finally get uh, 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 counter-battery fire, so we get, we, we completed the deep, the, uh, the I wonder order if anybody actually read the oh, pamphlets. <laughs> well, we, we never do whether these uh, pamphlets were really meant for the German civilians or the German army. But I'm certain that they got they at least got the civilians if they, mm -hmm. they weren't any, weren't any German soldiers out there. It was a classic scene in Battleground, yeah, where George Murphy picks up a bunch of them and takes off into the woods. Yeah, you have to think, well, is that what the Germans <laughs> did? <with her? laughs> have you been back over this to visit? I was back just once with a group okay. in 1971. There were 170 of us. Oh. Went over on a on a in a on a tour, and we toured some of the battlegrounds. Yeah. Yeah. Did you remember it all? Yeah, we remembered some of it. A lot of it had changed, and I like the time though. Yeah. It's such a phenomenal memory for all of these cities. Yeah, and and, and then we we were we had quite a number of of people on this on this tour who had been captured in the in the town of Hurleyshine, and that was quite difficult for them. Oh. And because they had lost, lost so many of their buddies in this town, mm -hmm. and uh, they got back to this town for the first time since, uh, since they were captured. Were there many monuments uh, uh, in Russia? Yes, and they, in some of these towns, they deliberately let a, a pillbox 
or something yeah. uh, as a as a monument. Yes. Mm -hmm. and, yeah, that's that's true. Did you find uh, your plaque on any one, any particular one? Uh, yes, yeah, the Twelfth Armored has, has a plaque in this in this uh, on this town of Carlisle. Yes, yes, it does. And uh, D-Day beaches, there's just about every pillbox there. There's got two or three plaques. Yes. On them, I've been thinking. Yes. Yeah. yes. Yeah. And are you in the veterans group now? Is I am. I'm a. I'm a uh, member of uh, of the uh, uh, VFW in Green Township. That's the 10th 380, and a member of the, lo of the local uh, uh, Purple Heart group, which has about 55 to 60 members. Mm -hmm. And then I attend the uh, 12th Armored uh, reunions, and in 44 years, I have missed four reunions. And I'm getting ready to go to, to my next one in uh, Minneapolis in early September. Um, so I've been active in this group for a long time. I've been uh, president of it back in the, in the early 80s when it, we had about 4,000 members. And we're down now to less than 1,500. Wow. And we're getting the, uh, the second and third generation to join as actual active members to carry on when the rest of us are uh, gone. Yeah, uh, so that's the story on that. But the 12th Armored has a quite an active group. So we have a, we have a monthly newsletter that that has been in uh, in, uh, in existence all the time since World War II, and we, they've never missed publishing an issue. And the reason that uh, it's been so successful is that each one of the units in the division has a unit rep that sends in a column each month. Oh, nice. So. Uh, it's sort of tapering down, tapering down yeah. badly. Yes. When I go to reunions, uh, I find very few people that I knew 20, 30, and 40 years ago. Mm -hmm. A lot of new ones and a lot of younger people, a lot of second and third generation people. Well, thank you very much. Do you have anything else you want to say? Or? Well, that pretty much covers it, except I think you did a fine job. <laughs> your, your memory is a lot better than mine, and I'm younger than you. Thank Some you. of those, those cities you just spilled off are just perfect to me. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for your service in the country, too.